Hello, and welcome to the fifth ever episode of DevOps Directive Office Hours. Uh, today, I am joined by David McKay, uh, also who goes by Raw Code on Twitter, and he has a YouTube channel in which he covers lots of uh, Kubernetes. He has a series in which he essentially has people break Kubernetes clusters and then on screen live try to fix them. So that's a super cool series. Welcome to the show, David. Hi there. It's a pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me. Yeah, glad to have you here. And so today we're going to take a look at an open source project that you started and are working on called Comtria. Can you tell us a little bit more about what that project is? Yes, definitely. So Comtria is kind of essentially a configuration management tool in that you provide manifests and tell it the state of the system that you want, and it's going to go away and try and, and do that for you. So it's fair to consider it maybe something like uh, Ansible or Puppet Chef, Salt Stack, all those other great tools. I think where Comtria is different is that it really focuses on local host and being a tool for my dot files is what it started out as. But you know, it's kind of grown a little bit since then. And it's written in Rust, so you know, bonus brownie points there, right? <laughs> Awesome, awesome. And so I'll, I'll have you share out your screen and maybe you can pull up the documentation in the GitHub repo. In the meantime, I'll grab a link to your channel. Uh, everyone should go check out David's channel. It's a good one. And I'll paste that in the chat. Cool. Awesome. So yeah, this screen that we, we have here. Maybe zoom one click as well. I should know better. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. yeah, so this this web page here is the Comtria.dev. It's uh, it's our documentation and, and homepage, kind of all in one. Uh, I just, I'll thank Phil from our community. He actually started the migration of this from my really crude attempt at docs at the start. So I really appreciate his efforts there. Uh, but we're continuing to improve our documentation. Uh, it's, it's one of those things that it's not the first thing you write in a project, of course. I'm, I'm more focused on delivering feature, feature, feature. Um, but I am slowing down a little bit to focus on the doc. So I, ho I hope they're useful. We're going to use them today. Uh, so I'll be making mental notes for any holes and gaps and things that I need to fix. But yeah, you can check out comtria.dev, get all the documentation. This, this is the inspiration of the name of the project. This is Harlan from SG1. Yeah, if you're not a Stargate fan, he was a robot that kind of kidnapped SG-1 and created robot versions of them to live forever on his abandoned planet with him. Uh, and it's just a cool name that I wanted to use for a project for so long. Uh, and I had the domains, which helped. So, nice, uh, nice. How, how long did you own the domain before you populated it? Uh, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't too long. <laughs> that was a relatively new one that I bought, and I was like, I, mean, I need to use this or something. And I've got loads of domains that I could have easily picked. But yeah, this one was fresh in my mind, and I was like, yeah, let's do something with it. So, Perfect. As far, as far as installation goes, we try to make it really easy. One of the, let me back up a little bit. One of the goals of Contria is really to provide a tool that is a binary that can run anywhere. So while we do provide these little helpers, uh, you know, curl bash scripts aren't for everybody, but if you just want to get started quickly, those, those do work. Uh, and we also provide binaries on our GitHub page. Uh, we've got uh, Apple, Windows, and uh, x64 Linux. We do provide more binaries on some releases. Uh, there are longer term releases. We provide builds that are based on muscle C, that work on BSD. We provide builds that are ARM, etc. Uh, there's a small bug in the cross compiler that we use in the Rust project called Cross that just means that it's difficult for me to do that on every release, but I'm hoping that gets fixed soon. So, come try. We really do want to run on anything, and in fact, because it's written in Rust, it can, we can actually compile it for Android and for iOS and for you know, Raspberry Pis and, and anything. So, really cool. Cool. But yeah, you can get started with this wonderful curl bash one liner that people always say is horrendous, but a really good way to get started with a, a fresh project. Uh, yeah. And so the plan for today is you're going to kind of walk us through what the tool is, give us a little demo, and then we'll we'll brainstorm on some new feature to, to start hacking on. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, cool. maybe I should just show you it working first. Or do you want to, in fact, let's we'll cover a little bit more about the docs to get the, the vocabulary out, and just so you're familiar with that, and then we can... We yeah, can yeah. Perfect. So the CLI, we just run Contria and provide a, a manifest location. Uh, there's one really cool feature here that I'll talk about. 
is that like, two cool features and I'm, I'm going to double down on myself here but <laughs> one of the biggest problems that i had and i think i have this on the home page uh, when i say here's alternatives and i talk about angible and salt stack but one of the things that i love about angible is that i can do anything with it and i have playbooks and i get really great output that tells me what it's doing right? i have loads of love for angible where it really fell down for me particularly for that local host setup was I just want to run like an individual task within a, a larger playbook that gets really difficult mm -hmm. to the point where I was structuring my playbooks to only have a single task and then trying to compose them in this way and that's not great there's too much boilerplate involved there so one of the things I was I just had to have Contra do is like I want to be able just to do run this one manifest that's it ignore all the rest Something else will come to come try and we can talk about this on the as we look at the issues and talk about maybe what we want to add is the ability to also label manifests and actions within manifests and just really target what I want to be able to run. So that was really important to me. The other thing that's really uh, cool here is that I also want to be able to run come try without actually having my manifest available locally. There's use hmm. cases for this, particularly cloud in it is the one that I use a lot. Um, so whenever I spin up, you know, machines on Amazon, Equinix Metal, Google Cloud, for me, my user data is now just a com trial with a remote URL where it's going to pull it, run all the manifests, and then it's done. Cool. So yeah, those are those are two cool features that I think would be cool. Uh, I, sorry, I just seen Waleed comment who's trying to teach me Ansible now. Thanks, Waleed. <laughs> you you can do that in Ansible, of course. Uh, com trial is just nicer and easier. You'll believe me. <laughs> All right, so let's couple, let's uh, tackle the vocabulary. So, the manifest is kind of our our first building block, and that just means a YAML file. That's all a manifest mm -hmm. is. We have to provide a list of actions within a manifest that we wish Contraya to execute, and we just use this inline tag of an action with the name of the action to tell it which one to run. So we only have a few actions available right now. But they're enough to do most of the things I need to be able to do. And we'll expand on that as we, we, we well, as people start using Comtria for more weird things, I'm sure. Yeah. With the command or run action, we just provide the command that we want to run. So that's probably still a bit small. Manifests can also have dependencies. So you can have a depends key here and then just list any other manifest that you need to execute first. Uh, so Comtria does build a DAG of all your manifests and the dependencies. And we'll try to run them in a a smart way one of the things i will be working on very soon is actually an asynchronous executor which will run any manifest at the same level at the same time based on the number of threads on your machine okay it's going to be cool. stupid fast i mean it's already fast but it's going to get stupid fast and if we take a look at the actions this is what we have available thus far one we can run commands two we can provision files and directories and the secret sauce of contraya is really great package management across a collection of providers. So we've already looked at the kind of command.run in that first example. We'll just take a quick look at uh, one of the file examples. So here you can see that we just say we want a file.copy action. We have a concept of a managed file, which just means it's in a files directory, very much like Ansible. We'll see that as we take a look at, at my manifests. We specify where we want to put it. We have the ability to render that through our context. This is just Jinja style templating. Again, hopefully familiar to anyone who's used any of these other similar tools. And then we can specify the permissions that we want available on the file. Uh, directory and symlinks are pretty much the same, so I'm not really going to look at them just now. Uh, but we will dive into packages because I think this is where things get a little bit more interesting. And in I'm trying to make sure that manifests work across any operating system you know i said come try is just a binary that you can run almost anywhere so for me i am a serial operating system installer my mac i wipe it clean and do a fresh install every 30 days without fail just boom done i also switch regularly between windows playing with wsl2 and i also switch to linux where i run arch linux I, i've got to say i run arch linux it's like the rule <laughs> of running arch linux but you know, so I, I'm never really spending too much time in a single operating system. And I really want my dot files just to work regardless of where I am. And that was really important to me as well. What we'll do is we'll take a look at the different variations that you can use the package install. So this is the simplest one where we just say we want to run the package install action and I want to install something called curl. 
That's it. What's really cool about this is if I'm on Debian or Ubuntu, it's going to detect that and try to use Aptitude as the package manager. If I'm on Mac, it's actually going to go, okay, you probably want Homebrew, and it will actually install Homebrew for me if it's not there, and then install curl. And if I'm on Windows, it will use Winget, the new official package manager for Windows, and it will install the packages from there if they're available too. It also supports list and text, so you know you can group things in any logical fashion depending on your use case or just whatever you're trying to do. And you can get very specific about the provider that you want to use. So you know here are actually all the providers that we support out of the box. Uh, Debian variants, Aptitude. If you're on FreeBSD, it will use BSD PKG package. I'm not sure. Uh, Mac Homebrew, although Homebrew does work on Linux too, and it works out the out the box with uh, Contraya. I forgot the name of my own project. When you get on Windows, and then of course Arch support, so it will try to use uh, Ya and provide the. We'll actually install and bootstrap Ya for you too, which is just a Pac-Man wrapper that supports the Arch user repositories. Which if you run Arch, you definitely just want access to. Yeah, we can override a provider if we want. Next cool thing is that you can provide the repository, so especially useful for uh, Ubuntu-based systems with PPAs and. Uh, <laughs> and homebrew which has taps so here i'm actually just installing qblocks and telling it the tap name is here and it just handles it for me again i don't need to worry about any of this stuff and then if you if you specify a dependency that doesn't exist on said platform does it just give you a warning or what what sort of happens in that case no you can't ask that question because the behavior is not ideal um <laughs> you you will get an error on your manifest run uh, one of the things that we don't have the ability to do with the providers is block them from running on platforms so okay um, i mean i'll cover all the caveats here but let's say you do this on a windows machine it will try mm -hmm. to run brew and it will fail this manifest but failing that manifest just it will carry on it, you know so it just kind of gets skipped uh, and you'll get enough information to let you know why it couldn't run but we will talk about really cool stuff that we're working on to make that better too. Cool. Okay, now the variant support we have. This is early days and we're working on making this a lot better. I've got examples of the proposed syntax. Um, we're going to be looking at using common expression language from Google. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but we, we can talk about that. But right now you can just say, I want to package install cube control. And then on Homebrew, it's actually called Kubernetes CLI, although this alias does work, so this is contrived. But we can say that we have a variant overlay uh, on macOS where the name is actually going to be substituted here. Um, and actually, this entire spec under the variant is all of the fields that are supported here. So you can over, you can actually have different repositories as well, or, to even, or even specify a provider for that install too. And this, is, again, is one of the things that was really important to me, is I just wanted to find my manifest once. And yes, I can do this with Ansible and Salt, using Ginger Maps and other conditionals, but I just want a nice declarative way of saying, this is what I want. And, yeah. and I really, really discourage this, but I will show it because there is an escape hatch and that Ginger is completely supported within the manifest. So you can skip things um, if you need to by just saying if user.username is root. Uh, and that will use any context. Of course, user is the only context we have right now, but I think you and I may add a new one on this episode. So that is the, that's it. I think that's all of the actions that we have right now and all of the cool stuff that we provide with packages. How, how cool. does that look to you? Having yeah, that, that looks time? awesome. <laughs> could, you, could you pull up maybe your config and show us maybe what it looks like for a particular use case? Ah, of course. All right. Uh, and while while you're doing that, I'll go through a few comments. We've got uh, the Fire Flash from Germany. Hello, welcome. Donnie uh, is a, another person who's been a guest on this show. Donnie Roofs from the Netherlands. Um, we've got some comments about Ansible that you already addressed. And then Walid is is egging us on. <laughs> Here we go. Enable bad practices. I do say discouraged in the docs, and it is there only as an escape hatch until I show you the new stuff that we're working on. And we're adding new predicates to the manifest, which will support only in where syntax. I'll show you it. Um, but yeah, the ginger is just there. Like If you really need to do something bad, I don't want Comtria to stop you, so you can do it. Uh, but that's one of those I think things, that's, right? Sorry, that's I a really know. key feature in in almost any of these platforms, right, is having an escape hatch so that 
if the person reaches the boundaries of what is supported, they can extend it maybe in a hacky way temporarily and then maybe roll some changes into the upstream to, to support their use case more officially. Yeah, I, th I think the challenge with all of these stuff, all these tools and software is, is that, you know, when you try to provide a declarative API, is that you're already expressing opinions that you have as the contributor and the maintainer of the project. And, it's, and the minute you have a conflict of interest between what my priorities are and someone else's, those escape hatches are just mandatory at that point. Because I can say, yeah, you never do this. This is how you install the package. But there, there's always edge cases. For sure. I'm gonna, I, I won't defend myself anymore. The, the escape hatches there you can use <laughs> if, you, if you want. All right, let's take a look at uh, something simple. So this is these are my real dot files for for my, my systems. And I've added an escape hatch here just to kind of show it working. So we uh, maybe I should delete it now that everyone thinks it's a horrible idea, but it, <laughs> it's there. So this just says I want to install something. Uh, this assumes that I'm only going to work on a Mac, so I'm just saying the repository is homebrew cask fonts, and then we have a list of fonts that I want to install. And this ev condition just works if I wanted to. But we'll remove it for now. We can add it if we want to play with that later. Mm -hmm. um, so let me. one of the other reasons that this all works this way is that you know there are... Uh, plenty of tools out there to manage dot files and in fact people always ask me why aren't you just using like brew bundle and having a brew file and then doing that and i just think that the configuration with the declaration that i want a package installed should always live together you'll see that i have a spanzo here which is like a text expander clone but it's open source and written in rust so of course i'm installing it but <laughs> you know i have my files with my config next to my manifest it says this is how to install it and i always like to group things that way like I don't want a brew fail in a root and then all of my dot files scattered around somewhere else. Like I really do think the structuring of that is important, at least at least to me. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's one of the weird things that I think catches people out when they play with Contria. Um, manifest names are the name of the file. So this manifest is, is oh, I know that's really small on the sidebar, so let me zoom in for a moment. But you know, the manifest name here is I term two. This one is macOS. This one is Slack. We also do something This comes from SaltStack. But if you have a main.yaml inside of a directory, then the name of the manifest will inherit the name of the directory. So if I only want to run the Expanzo manifest, it will be called Expanzo. Got it. And I think this is all, you know, pretty standard package install stuff. There's nothing uh, too crazy here. Uh, we've got more repositories. Oh yeah, and we have extra args. So this is another one of these escape hatches where uh, and to install NeoVim, if you want to compile it from source rather than use like the bottle of the compiled binaries from brew, um, we can use extra args and these pass, these are passed directly to the package manager provider that is going to be used by Contria. Uh, and this just passes the dash dash head. So this is essentially a uh, brew install. NeoVim, add like so. Uh, just useful. And you can pass as many of those extra args as you want. You can, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that again, one of those, another escape hatches, if you need them and you want to directly integrate, of course, one of the things you should do when you're doing that is probably hard code the provider as well, just so you don't pass a dash dash head to apt and then get more errors. But again, my dot files right now are focused on Mac just because I'm using them exclusively now here, but I am now starting to roll those out to Windows and BSD and Linux, so um, it will evolve, especially as I'm adding more providers now. Okay, uh, we'll show off just one more thing that I think is probably interesting, is that we have our Espanzo here with the repository and then the file.link. Uh, file.link just means that the symlink is a file, but you can actually symlink to an entire directory. Uh, so if we pop open my dev Z shells, um, you'll see here, this whole directory is also a symlink. So let me just check that that works. There we go. So our includes is pulling in all the includes from our dot files. Uh, and I'll feel, I'm going to say brave, but you can see my command history is already filling this in. I have run it already today, just so that I didn't look too foolish on your channel. Um, but you know, I can remove my entire Z shell configuration to the point where when I open a new shell, I get nothing. Mm -hmm. And then we can run some trial. I'm going to run it uh, from here. Uh, yeah, so here's the dash M flag where I can just run fonts. 
and I'll kind of walk you through the output before I run it for all things. But this will filter down to a single manifest, and then it tries to kind of give you a little bit of information to tell you what it's running. Now, the log output is something that I probably change all the time. I'm trying to work out just how much information to give you by default versus adding on you know, verbose flags to increase that. But right sure. now, it's because it's an early stage project, I really want you to have a bit of confidence in what it's actually doing. So we can see here that it's going to run a command with privileged false, uh, and it's going to run a brute app. <coughs> One of the things, and we'll see this when we take a look at the actions and the, and the atoms that make up this kind of uh, runtime, is that Comtria tries to do as little as possible at all times. So it's going to check if it needs to do something before actually doing it. I don't know how familiar you are with the guts of brew, but I'm now getting very, very familiar with how it works. <laughs> uh, it's actually kind of difficult to work out where if a tap is already available, at least using the brew CLI. So I've had to start kind of reverting to query in the disk. So there's a few, few hacks that we do with brew to kind of understand and reduce what we have to do. But what's important is we did the brew tap because the plan on that says always do it. And then there's nothing installed afterwards. So I'm going to uninstall our font and we will run our font again. And what we should see is we have a second command now where it's like, okay, we don't have this font installed. So now we're going to run another command and off we go. Okay, uh, I still have a broken Z shell, but let's give that one more minute before I fix it. Uh, we will add one more action. This time I will do a command.run with a command who am I. Command.run is special and it, it will always run. There's no plan step to work out if it, if it should run. So what we should see here is the brute app runs. And why have I got an error? My who am I fail, and that's awkward. So I've increased the verbosity by one. We can see the context that are provided. We can touch on that in a second. Ah, okay, uh, that's a bug. <laughs> you need to provide a directory to run the command. It's supposed to default to the current working directory. Um, and I actually knew that was a bug and I just haven't fixed it. So shame on me. <laughs> Why is that still failing? Let's try one more thing before I completely forget how my thing works. Huh. No such file or directory. All right, well, I guess we're fixing a bug. Um, no. Yeah, but what I wanted to show was that we could do privileged. Oh, true. you have a typo in your command. Someone in the chat just pointed out. <laughs> Who am I? Uh, I hate myself. Uh, so maybe we, yeah, there we go. Who was that? Oh, Kevin. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, the fire. Good, fire. good eyes, good eyes. That's that's right. the best part about live coding is that you've got many debuggers uh, helping you. Yeah, I was going to start debugging a bug that didn't exist, so that was a good catch. <laughs> All right, let's run that again. Yeah, cool, there we go. Ta -da. So it ran a command. We didn't see any output. We can increase the verbosity one more. We'll get a lot more output. And what we'll see is that we got an extra code of zero. We're standard what we got out. on standard out, there we go. And then standard error was zero. And of course, we can run this in privileged mode. Uh, so one of the things Comtria tries to do is handle privilege elevations in a very sensible way. Which means that if we run this again, uh, did I, sp oh, I really can't. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping for root. We're hoping for root. Uh, is that how you spell privilege? Yeah, right. Come on, I can do this. Oh, maybe I'll copy and paste. P-R-I-V-I-L. Yeah. Oh, wait, privilege is the... Ah, I can't remember how to do this. <laughs> Let's check out the atom. The atom. Go to the docs. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a good idea. I've got docs for this. So, command. Uh, of course, I haven't documented it. All right. Well, we do have an action. We can do a command. We can take a look at run. Pseudo. Shame on me. Uh, like I said, this is early days, and I change stuff a lot. So you need to kind of forgive me, but pseudo true should get is what we want. There we go. There we go. So 
we get a warning here saying, look, we have privilege <coughs> elevation that is required. We are going to kind of um, request your privileges just so you know why you're getting a password prompt. And it's going to tell you what it's actually going to execute. So there's no surprises that it's going to run, you know, maybe a crypto miner or whatever, if you were very unlucky. <coughs> and we got it here. So Cool. Phew. I know I'm forever going to add an alias of privileged to that pseudo action. <laughs> All right, so we're still in a position where I have broken dot files. It'll pop up in a terminal. So let's just run everything here, um, like so. And you'll see because these um, these dot files have been run regularly, is that you should see nothing to be done, nothing to be done to reconcile the manifest ninety percent of the time. I do need to make that work for Brutap, so you will only see Brutaps running. And then eventually we will get oh, the NeoVim head flag also will run every time. It's just a brew thing. But that did shall run. Yes, it did. So hopefully I open a new terminal. My Z shell configuration kicks in. It's going to download all of his plugins and my terminal will be back to. And that's cool. Contria. Nice. Oh, that's, that's cool. Yeah, my... I think you'll find that my uh, maturity when it comes to configuring all this stuff automatically is is relatively low. Like I, I have my my oh my zsh shell installed and configured, but I don't I don't redo it or change it very often. So <laughs> this is this is new to me. I spend more time tweaking uh, my dot files and my Z shell configuration probably than I do my actual day job. So I, I just I'm always <laughs> trying to make things a little bit better. Uh, I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, I'll just quickly show one more thing then over here. Yeah, please. Um, so I said that it supports uh, remote manifests. So, you know, let's just, uh, I'm going to run fonts just to keep the run a little bit quicker. But what it's going to do here is actually clone my dot files to a cache directory and then run the fonts against it. So you can see syncing the directory. If it's already there in the cache, it will do a pull and fetch and an update. Try and keep it up to date and then it runs through it as well and um, so this is really good for user data uh, especially when provisioning cloud machines uh, yeah much I, I think it's nicer than cloud in it of course i do have a level of bias there but i just think it's easier to work with um, and one of the things that you know we've been discussing there's a few contributors on the project now it's not just me thankfully but as the ability to kind of like well what if i want to consume other people's configurations and like been able to drop in and they say, I want your Kubernetes config or your ZHL config or oh, your VS code is really cool. I'm going to grab that and been able to provide them through include syntax as well. So lots of cool stuff coming, hopefully. Uh, I also mentioned predicate syntax. Uh, do you mind if I sh quickly sh run through what that will look like too? Yeah, yeah, please do. And and I have one more question on the, you're provisioning a cloud machine. Then do you just put like the uh, curl piped into shell plus uh, one executable command and it grabs the remote config. Is that how you've been doing it? Yeah, so my, my, <laughs> there we go. Can't type and talk at the same time. My uh, user data now looks like comtria.dev uh, bash comtria HTTPS. Got it. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I was thinking. You know, cool. those three lines are all I need now to provision a new cloud instance and uh, it works pretty well. As long as the repository is, is open, Source or like available if it's behind any sort of authentication, things get trickier. Uh, but you know, yeah. come try as an early project, we could add support for pulling secrets from certain locations and other stuff. But we'll, we'll see how things go. Okay, so let me find a. And hopefully, hopefully, you're not your your the set of things you're installing is not too sensitive. <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think. If you're using Comtry, you have to kind of work out your own uses there and make sure that you're you're happy with what's happening. But yeah, definitely. All right, let's grab da, da, da. maybe Z shell is just a good example. It does a few things. No, let's do Kubernetes. So one of the challenges that you need the escape hatch for right now, and I, I kind of touched on this when we were talking about the actions, is that. If I use the variant syntax and say on a Mac OS or Linux or Debian, let's do Debian, I can overwrite the command and do this, uh, or I can hard code the provider. So let's add both of those as examples. 
or I say provider is homebrew. We're in a situation now where it's not going to run on all machines because there may not be a variant overlay for the machine that you run on, which of course is mm -hmm. a, a problem or a bug. Uh, the other thing is that we hard coded our provider and there's no way to say that homebrew is only available on certain machines. So, you know, don't run it. Otherwise, we're going to get an error, which again, potentially a bug in your dot files, but Comtria wants to make this easier. So, uh, let me share Google cell. So Google has this project called common. Oh. <laughs> nice try, Google. Uh, <laughs> Has this project called Cell, which is a common expression language, and it allows basically it's like a s subset of JavaScript, uh, similar to what Skylark is for Python, etc. That allows you to do simple expressions that resolve to like true or false values, and not always true or false values, but and what I want to use it for definitely the case. So really, what I want to be able to do here is to provide an only context and say, well, only run this where my operating system. Uh, name is macOS. And then now this action within the manifest will only run when the predicates of their only are true. Mm -hmm. We also want to modify the variant syntax to be a bit better than just this because it's not, like I said, Comtria has to run everywhere. So what does Debian mean? Well, what about architecture? And then are the package names different? And then uh, am I a root user or not a root user? Like there's all these different constraints that you're going to need to hit that escape patch. And I don't want you to use the escape patch. So the variant syntax is going to change. And in fact, what we're going to see is a variant where a where clause again with the Google expression language. And I'll just say name equals this. And then we can overlay the list with different package names here. And this is going to give us a lot more flexibility. Uh, even when it comes to commands, so you can imagine a situation where we've got. All right, I know I'm going quite fast here. Hopefully, I'm making. So sense. yeah, what is, what is that <laughs> second list under the variants? So we've got a list of these packages we're installing, starting at line four. Then we've got a a variant saying where Mac OS. Then this list starting on line ten is the Mac OS specific packages that we don't want to install anywhere else. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. this list here. Um, well, we run on every machine where there isn't a variant that matches the where predicate. So anything that isn't Mac, this is what we install. Okay. However, when these are true, we overlay this entire block onto this. So this would become my terrible typing. Oh, it, it uh, eliminates the the ones that are in the list already. It... So th now we're getting into the, 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 the <laughs> details, but yes, there is a, there is a strategy. Okay, of like merge, merge versus, <laughs> got it. <laughs> yeah, so all the flags are going to be there. It's a work in progress right now. One of our contributors, Felipe, is, is working on the Saturday deserialization so that we don't break backwards compatibility with what we have now, uh, but still allow all of these new predicates on top of it. So cool. hopefully we'll be able to roll that out in the, the coming days or weeks, but very excited by it. Um, and one of the things right now is variance only works on package.install. And I've already realized in just like a few months of using Comtria that I, I just need variants everywhere. So where we have command.run, we can say command is who am I? But then we're in a position where, okay, that doesn't exist on Windows. So I actually want variants across the entire stack. And this would be some PowerShell thing that I don't know. But you know. <laughs> uh, And the same for files. You know, what if I've got a file.copy? The paths on Debian might be different from um, Red Hat definitely different on Mac and then definitely yeah. different on Windows. So we want to provide a ubiquitous and stable API to work across all these major operating systems and do what you want to do in a nice declarative fashion. Cool. Got it. There's quite a lot there. Uh, hopefully I didn't go too fast and that all made sense though. <laughs> no, I, I'm following. Uh, hopefully, hopefully the folks in the audience are as well. Um, but yeah, that's, that's super cool. All right. So, so should we add some features? Yeah. Should we pop into the issues tab? I know you had a few pre-populated that might spark our, spark our, uh, ideas. Can't believe that was pseudo and not privileged. That's going to, that's going to bug me. Right. Anyway. Yeah. So we've got our, um, issues page here. There's a nice simple one I added this afternoon. Um, this is a, a request that I get 
regularly from people that are starting to evaluate come try it and is that the context that we provide let me show you that uh, and they want to show the context when you're executing or when where are they looking for that context uh, let me just <laughs> pull up the top oh, why did i do a double verbose that was my fault sorry there we go yeah, so context and comtrier are variables that we make available to you within the either the ginger style templating or mm -hmm. within the predicates that are coming, so the only and where. Right now, this is the extent of the context. Basically, four values under a user key. So we can tell you what, what your username is, we can tell you what your name is on the system, we can tell you where your home directory is, and we can tell you where the operating system expects config values to be stored. And that is mm -hmm. it. Uh, we have a really great discussion opened by one of our early adopters, Krillif, uh, who wants to be able to use context to get, I know there's a lot of text, I'll zoom in, but you know, I don't expect anyone to read it. <laughs> but what they're saying is like, you know, I used salt stack in the past. I've used Puppet, you know, salt has grains, Puppet has fats. There's all these pieces of the information, all these all this information from the host that we want to be able to make available within the rendering or manifest system. So I thought we could try something that would be nice and simple to get us started, introduce us to a little bit of Rust uh, and hopefully uh, cover some of the primitives of how this all works and just expose what is the operating system and maybe architecture or something else to the context system. We should be able to see that print out nicely at the top in our debug mode and then we'll know if we've been successful. Yeah, and then that feature is a, a precursor to one of the filters you were showing earlier, right? Of being able to say like os.name or whatever. Exactly, yeah, right. Right now, even if we did add the deserialization and semantics for the predicates, you would only have access to username <laughs> or home directory. <laughs> that, that's not gonna get you what you need. So. Yeah, no that that seems like a a good a good first bug or a first enhancement, I suppose, not a, oh, not yeah. a bug. Definitely. So I, I've already assigned it to myself. So <laughs> uh, we know that we're working on this. I, I assigned one other one to us too, depending on how brave we feel. Uh, but another common request that I get from people is that they want to be able to uh, do like a GitHub dot binary action, and it's going to go to the project, get the latest binary, install it on the system, and then chim out at plus X you know, for cube control or kind or uh, Terraform and all these other tools. So, uh, As an alternative to the package managers that you currently have. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, in theory, we could make it a package manager with a provider GitHub where it just pulls binaries from a project, but I think we'll, we'll do something slightly more uh, bespoke. If, if we have the time and uh, we're feeling brave. Because I'm not entirely sure we'll be successful trying to do this, but we can definitely give it our best bet. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Well, <coughs> excuse me. Let's make sure I have all the recent codes. And I just linked the come try a uh, GitHub in the chat. If anyone wants to go check out the the repo, it is all there. Yeah, I'm really close to 100 stars. So, you know, if we can make that happen, that would be cool. Oh, yeah, I'll start right now. <laughs> 98. We got two more to go. There's eight, there's eight people watching. We got to get to 100. That's easy. Awesome. Okay, so we pulled our, our latest one here. I'm going to add a work tree. Uh, we'll call this branch feature. Uh, what do we want to do? Uh, context OS. Uh, we'll call this context OS. And then we have a new work tree. We'll pop that open in code. Uh, and now, do you want a quick tour of the code base? Or yeah, let's you... let's just jump in and, and look at how everything's laid out maybe as a starting point. Cool. Well, we have our, our main.rs. This is obviously where everything starts. We set up all of our logging. We build our graph. We pull down the manifest. Um, it's only... 380 lines of code. It's probably still 300 lines of code more than I want on my main.rs, but I have been slowly extracting <laughs> stuff out to to modules. Oh, I think what Elite just said he was 100. Hold on. Da, da, da. Da, 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 da. <gasps> Made it. Go. Nice. 
Awesome. Good work, team. <laughs> all right. So we've got our main RS here. This is where we do all the building of the, the DAG, the graph that we can traverse and, and do the executor. Um, we won't spend a lot of time in here. It is verbose and complex to a certain degree. Um, but we don't have to worry about any of that because all of the magic happens in our other directory. And my mm -hmm. computer is a little slow, so I'm going to close some of these apps. It should be okay. Okay. So we've already seen that we have a manifest as a, a user kind of API, and that you create a file, we call that a manifest. You can see here we've got the providers for loading it. So right now we support local and Git. We could add more providers to there if people want to see their manifest come from other locations. Um, but we don't need to touch that. Once we parse the manifest, we get something called an action. The action is again the end user API of the thing that you want to do. That would be command.run, directory.copy, fail, copy, and link. And then of course package install. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the in the first version of Contraya, the action files were getting really complicated. We were doing all the Rust code there. Um, and I just decided that if I really want people to contribute to this project, I need to make that easier. So through a lot of back and forwards, uh, talking to some of the early contributors, I said, okay, well, what if we had a, a concept of an atom, like an atomic unit, an operation, something that Contraya could do. Each app, each atom has a really simple API. One plan, do I need to do this or can I skip it? And the other one, do the thing. And that is it. So now we're in a position where if, if we did, if we do, if we did, hmm, if we do want to add a new action, like GitHub binary, GitHub release, whatever, is that mm -hmm. we only really need to emit some data structures and then the executors will handle the rest. So let's see what that looks like. I think file.link might be a good one. Uh, let's do copy. Link has a little bit extra complexity, but we, we can go through that too. So <clears throat> the first thing that we have to do is just define what does this action look like from a data structure point of view. And this is the same API that mm -hmm. you would enter in your manifest. So from and to the permissions and whether we want to template it or not. We can ignore this little bit of octal juggling that we do. Um, just so that you can type in a decimal value, we convert it to the octal. That's Linux permission stuff, let's just ignore it. Uh, but then we have this concept of a plan. So you can plan an action and you can plan an atom. A plan of actions returns a list of atoms and then you can query the atoms to see if they need to run. We have a little bit of code which will render the action if we need to. So, you know, if you do decide to template one of your files, all the contexts are injected and rendered. Uh, maybe some link would have been easier, but <laughs> we'll keep going. This is the important bit. So, this is the last statement in the plan for the action. And all it's saying is, I want to return a vector, which is uh, uh, an array of slice. Mm -hmm. And we return a slice of steps. So all the steps that the executor will take and the steps contain an atom. And then those atoms, there is some control flow on top of that. So I know I'm getting really right into the, the nits and grits of this. Please feel free to ask questions or just um, tell me to skip it. But um, we want to be able to say, do this thing, which is an atomic operation. Um, the initializers will allow us to do anything before that to maybe stop the run if we don't need to do it, or the finalizers allow us to then modify the control flow of any subsequent atom. So, and so the the copy action that we're on consists is composed of a make directory, a clone path, and a change permission, and whatever other steps follow, right? Is sort of what we're seeing here. Yeah. So step one, when we do a file dot copy, is first to make sure the parent location exists, so that we mm -hmm. can actually put the file to there. So we do a make dir dot p. Um, I'm not happy with like whenever we see an exec here, that means we're doing a command execution. This just means yep. that an atom is not going to run in every operating system that I would want it to. Like a make dir probably won't work on a Windows. Yeah. Um, so you know, I am replacing these execs with uh, native bindings, but right now the make dir dot p does exist, unfortunately. In fact, it does run on Windows because I tested it, but there are other operating systems where that may not work. Our and so that step... will eventually be replaced with uh, a Rust function that has native bindings to each operating system and checks if that directory exists on that operating system. 
exactly yes uh, and that's what okay. we do with every other step here so every other step here is an atom that has native operating system bindings through rust to do the job that it needs to do the make there is just the last one that i haven't created a an atom to create directories yet uh, mm -hmm. we could maybe do that too we've got loads of options so next we define another data structure so the next step has an atom we can ignore initializers and finalizers for now but i can show you an example if you're if you're curious but we have a file create atom which just needs to know the path and it will go and create the file we then change the modifications on it telling it the path and then the mode and then we set the contents of the file and that is how we do a file copy using the atoms within the contrast system and the atoms you said are a relatively new concept right you i think you just made that refactor recently right uh, yep <laughs> four four days uh, within the last week nice and i mean i can we can definitely take a look at the older code what you'll see is that with each of the actions like uh, you know this is 140 lines 30 of its tests the rest is just a data structure and then there's this little bit of setup that only this action actually needs you know if we take a look at link uh, all we're doing is checking whether the path exists and then emitting the data structure so uh, this one's a lot simpler in fact there's a lot more tests than there is actual code uh, I'll show you the initializers and the finalizers out of you know curiosity more than anything. But the P the BSD package provider is a little bit special in that um, it will output telling you if an installation will remove any other packages. And normally we don't want to remove stuff unless you explicitly allow it. So <coughs> excuse me. So if I scroll down to our install stage, we have our first step which will run the PKG install with a kind of dry run dash n flag, which says just go and look what will happen if I run this. Mm -hmm. And then we modify the control flow by saying that stop if output contains remove. So if our dry run tells us that the installation of this package will remove any other package, show that error to the user and make they can make that decision if they want to remove it and then run it again or just ignore it. And so the workflow would be manually remove it, then rerun, come try a, and see yeah. what, what comes out of the install dash n. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've gone back and forwards on this so many times now about adding a force flag to actions to be, you know, just, just we don't care, just do as I tell you. And I always lean on, like, this is not configuration management for a server, although we can use it for that. Like, this is your dot files, probably, your local machine. And I think we should probably be a bit more careful with that. But... I do go back and forwards on it, and tomorrow I may change my mind. So, but for right now, we try not to do anything destructive on the machine. Uh, I don't. Do we have any initializers? Yes. Uh, the, the, the we have a command exists initializer. Let me show you the, the structure. Okay, so these are all the actions. These are the atoms and we have in our steps initializers and finalizers so this is the output contains one again it's mostly test but it just allows us to check if an atom outputted the string that contains a value we also have a command run or a command found which can tell an atom not to run if a command already exists so if i search for command found oh, i'm not actually using the initializer yet that explains it yeah, so we could say... Already uh, exists, meaning that is in your path, so if you executed it, it would execute the, the program. Uh, or what do you yeah. mean by already exists? Yeah, I think my intention was to use this for the... I'm not sure if I was using it, but for the homebrew provider, where it would say if brew exists, if doesn't exist, go and install brew. Uh, Got it. So it can be used in that sense. Does this help an atom run or not? Uh, and then there's a the context where we'll be spending the next however long it takes us to implement it, these are nice and simple. You'll be glad to know. But all we need to do is provide a, a data structure that we can attach an implementation to. It has to expose two functions. One is a get prefix. The prefix is how we reference it in the Jinja, so user dot. And then it returns a vector of key value pairs or key list pairs that can have the values that we want to return. That's it. Yeah. All right. Uh, feeling confident about all that code? 
yeah i think yeah. i think we we just copy this file put in a new one called uh <laughs> os.rs <laughs> it's exactly how i would do it so, <laughs> first the rs we paste it so let's uh, touch on a little bit of the rust stuff here and um, this this is this is my flow as well i do copy and paste to get all that boilerplate done so normally i would come in here let's say all right i'll leave one example comment it out i'll update this this is now called os and then do a yep. search and replace on the other stuff you're not going to get your autocomplete with the Rust language server this way because Rust is a module-based language. So we actually need to come into mod.rs and we have to tell the language server that this now exists. And that comment is actually specific to that. So we'll leave that there. And now we should be able to get our autocomplete. If I could type, yeah, we go. Uh, so that's always something that I kind of forget, up, uh, forget at first. So, uh, let me just ask a clarifying question there. Until you imported it into mod.rs, Rust, your basically your VS Code plugin didn't know where to find the Rust language definition. Yeah, the file would never be compiled. Um, okay. No autocomplete would work. Essentially, it doesn't exist. It's just a file, but because nothing links to it, there's no references to it. It's just orphaned. Doesn't doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. All right, so we probably don't need access to DIRS, which is a module for getting operating system directories. We do need some context stuff here, and we need to change our implementation here. So let me cover a little bit about what we have right now. This is the simplest context provider that we can have because it does nothing. <laughs> All right. mm -hmm. The way that Rust is not a, an object-oriented programming language, so, you know, it's, you know, you don't have classes and we, we don't have uh, inheritance or, or any of those things. What we do have is, is traits and the ability to attach methods very much like Go does, you know, where Go, you would have a struct and then uh, that struct can have methods that can be applied to it uh, through a receiver syntax. Rust is a little bit like that, where we can say we want to implement a trait for this data structure, which just means on this data structure, I can call any of these methods. Uh, the um, traits that we are implementing here, the context provider is defined here. And this is like an interface. So we're saying that we have this thing, a trait called a context provider that must provide both of these functions with this signature. So we have guarantees mm -hmm. that we can always call this function on anything that implements this trait. And in fact, we could compile this right now and it would all just work, but we, we wouldn't see anything new. Uh, in fact, why don't we do a run? Code, yeah, so code. it's returning that empty vector of the context. Uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll, the prefix will be created. Yep. Fact, yeah, it will be created, but there will, there'll be no values in it. So I, I don't actually expect the output um, to show anything uh, once the compilation happens. This is the downside to Rust. You get a lot of really great things with the way the memory safety works and the runtime safety, but the compilation speeds are a little slow. <laughs> so we just need to give that 30 seconds, hopefully. I spend a lot of time looking at Rust C's output. <laughs> but we do get a nice little counter, so we know that we were done the last. Uh, your crates now. Maybe we should add something, make it a bit more visually appealing. Yeah, should we just hard, hard code some string there? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. Good call. Uh, so we'll call this Linux, even though we know it's not. Uh, <laughs> we'll call this OS name. There we go. There's our very simple context provider. All right, five more. And because it's compiling all of our dependencies, hopefully it catches that change we just made as well. But if we did have to compile it again, it would only be that one file that changed. It won't be as long. And this is because I used a git work tree. I probably should just have created the branch in my normal tree, and then we probably wouldn't have had to compile it all again. Mm. So they me. And 
All right. Fennel says hello. Hello, Fennel. Welcome, welcome to the welcome to the stream. All right. So, ah, okay. I forgot a step. Uh, we have a function. So all we, all that we've done thus far is make a module available for compilation. Mm -hmm. Generated uh, a working context provider, but hard coded. But yep. we have a function that is called here where it loads the context providers and we just need to connect the glue here. So we have to do a box new and then OS context provider. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't want to autocomplete. No, it's pulling in some random ah. package. <laughs> Let's try that again. OS context. There we go. And this is a structure which has actually no values. We're just using it as a type to attach those methods to. And it's complaining because. mismatched types ah okay so <laughs> well we're gonna we're, we're gonna learn some rust now so uh i was going to tell you what the box was but now we're going to fix our first problem uh, rust does type inference so when we have this it's actually assuming that we're getting a vector of user context providers so now i'm throwing in a new type and it's like oh wait i i don't, I don't know what this is anymore like why are you not a user context provider so, we're so now we need be... to update the type on the context providers. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to actually tell it. Actually, what we're getting is a uh, Dane context provider. And if that's happy, yep. Okay. So let's try and cover this because this is some, um, I'll speak from my own experience. When I was on Rust, this stuff confused the hell out of me, right? <laughs> but it's just the way that Rust works. So. Let's assume we're, you know, we're happy with the vector as a slice. Yep. We have a box. Now, a box is just a fixed size pointer in Rust that says that uh, I'm going to point to something else. And that's because Rust has to know the size of everything in memory and be able to kind of link to it. And I am not an expert in this. So if I say anything wrong, oops, I'm sorry, Rust people. But we have to tell it that we have a, a, a slice of pointers so they can allocate the right size of stuff to it. They can allocate the right space of memory for those pointers to exist, even though it's pointing to something of a random dynamic size, which is what the Dyn is here, uh, and a context provider. The reason this is a dynamic size is because this is a trait, and we don't know which copy of it we're going to get. These two structures could have completely different internals, different fields, mm -hmm. different uh, ints, strings, um, booleans, all have a different space in the heap. So we have to tell it again that this is dynamic and we don't know what to expect yet. So there's a little bit of type juggling. And that's and why then presumably somewhere in the background, it looks at the, the two different types and says what's the largest it could be and allocates enough such that it can use either. Yeah, I think and, uh, you know, Maybe. I'll, <laughs> I'll be naive and do some assumptions right now. Again, I'm apologies, uh, Rust developers that know more, but uh, yeah, our slice gets fixed size pointers on the heap, and then the other parts, the other dynamic stuff will be stored in non sequential memory where it can just be looked up and pointed to it and referenced. As that's my understanding of it, at least. <laughs> um, and it's, I think it's just because this is a slice, you know, like um, it needs to know how to allocate space for that. Because, you know, Rust is trying to make sure that whenever we pass something to a function, it actually gets moved in memory so that nothing else can reference it. And then we have this mm -hmm. concept of mutability and references and the way that we work with the types is all weird and wonderful, but it just takes a little bit of getting used to it. Um, and I'm sure we'll touch on more of this as we explore the API a little bit more. What's important right now is yeah. that we've added our new context provider and it's going to show up, right? <laughs> I don't know if that was a question or a statement, but it's a bit of both. <laughs> it's going to show up for there sure. Linux. So, All right. We now have added a new context provider that exposes some piece of information from our host. Now, we want to make this real now. So let's jump into our OS context provider. And uh, we have access to a crate called OS Info that we're actually using in other packs of Comtria. So we'll use that here. And it's got some functions. 
got some function. Guess I'll import it. Uh, uh, do, do. Pretty sure I can just do that. I don't know why. All right, let me make it happy for a second first. And work out why I'm not getting my info. I thought there was a function. Was it just get? Yeah. Yeah, get. Mm. Let's try again then. I don't know what's going on. Let's try assigning it to a variable. So we'll call this our OS info. In fact, let's not uh, break the name. Get. Oh. Okay, that's better. Um, I'm just going to blank this out again for a second. So this is, again, another one of the reasons I really like working with, with Rust is that we get Rust Analyzer, which is doing all, like, you can see all these little comments in my code where mm -hmm. it's saying, here are all the type inferences I've made. So it knows that we get back an info from osinfo.get. We can now use the autocomplete to say, okay, well, what do I actually have access to? So, uh, I mean, I could just pull up the docs, but if we just quickly take a look at this list, um, OS type might be something that we want. So let's click on that. And it's going to return a type, which I can't click on. There we go. Uh, which is an enum which has Alpine, Amazon, Android, all these different things here. So that's probably a good thing for us to expose as the context. Yeah. And it implements display, which means we're actually going to get a string representation of it as well and not the enum value, which is useful. Yeah, yeah. So we like type. Uh, we got that from here. Is there, is there also an architecture or something? Uh, we might need a new create for that, but we're definitely going to take a look. So we'll drop this in. It's complaining. And it's telling us... That we got an enum and we have a string, uh, and that's because we're not writing it to anything, so the display trait probably isn't kicking in. So we can try encouraging that by wrapping it in a string from. No, it doesn't like that either. All right, let's try and do some juggling. What have we got? Don't really want to do a sprint F on it. That seems a bit painful. I don't know if that'll work. <laughs> no, I didn't like that either. All right, what well, have we got access to? So, nothing. So this is the only way to convert it to a string. The only, there's no like raw, just get the name of the enum. Uh, so we, we could, so one of the things that we could do is actually do a match statement on our OS info OS type. Uh, and then we'd have to fill in all of the different versions and we could put our own thing, but I'm going to try and avoid that. I'm right. just trying to think of the best way to do it. <laughs> I'm stumped by a string juggle. What about... We don't have Sprint F in Rust, do we? Oh yeah, just search Sprint F in general. That's clever. Okay. And we got Rust... Oh yeah, we can use format. This, okay, so there's a format macro which should have come to me much quicker. And OS info, OS type. And this should put it through the trait for displaying it and give us what we need. Yeah. Phew. And I'm searching for Sprint F. Cool. In theory, that's everything we need, at least for the first piece of context. So if we run this again. Uh, 
Uh, we now know that our operating system name is macOS. Easy, right? Easy peasy. All right. So you mentioned architecture. Um, it's a, but, there's also a version and a bitness, I think, on the info object that we might want. Uh, okay. So let's just add two more of these. Let the formatter do its thing. And look at the API. So oh, that's another really annoying thing about Rush language server. As much as I have nice things to say about it, there are some um, weird things that you need to get familiar with is that you won't get autocomplete within a macro like this. Mm. <laughs> uh, so you'll need to just kind of jump back out. Uh, so we got code name, which is an option string. So let's do that first, just because I've seen it. Uh, and because this is an option, we'll probably do uh, unwrap or, uh, which means we can just have a default value of unknown. And what the is the unwrap? What does the unwrap do? Sorry. Yes. Uh, okay. So let me show that API again. So under code name, you see here we get uh, an option string, which means we're going to get either the value none or we're going to get a string. Mm -hmm. Now, because we're doing a format on this, we just want to be able to make sure that we don't get essentially like a null pointer exception, where it's like, oh, this is a none. I can't print none because none is none. So what we're saying is unwrap the, unwrap the option. And if there's no value, which is the or, return this instead. So it's okay, essentially just a it. default. Yep. OK, so what was the other API? We got fitness, which is and enum as well. So we're probably going to have to jump back into here. Maybe I should just pull up the docs instead of uh, <laughs> jumping around here aimlessly. Uh, there's fitness. OK, so yeah, we got unknown x32. And it also displays, uh, also implements display. So we're going to use the exact same trick that we used for our OS name. And for bitness, yep, we just do this. Uh, we don't need the format for this one, I don't think, because it should be a string already. It should be a string. Yeah. I don't know why my formatter didn't clean that up, but we'll do that. All right, let's see if we got anything else useful in here. You mentioned one more, right? Uh, I think version. All right, so we've got a version enum addition. Uh, And maybe that's plenty for now. Yeah, okay. The fire oh. flash says maybe also full information, which is in OS info. I don't see a full. Yeah. I'm not I, sure I what specifically he's referencing. All right, so let's see version enum where it, oh yeah, I think we can. The same as bitness. We don't really get much more info. Uh, seems to be. Oh, yeah, no. It's whether it's a rule. No, that's fine. Or whether it's like a 20.10 or a custom. Uh, does it, if it implements yeah, display, yeah. then yeah, OK. It implements display, so we'll just throw it in. <laughs> uh, and the last one was the addition, which is uh, just an option string. Again, nice and easy for us to work with. So let's add that in too. So we'll copy two more lines. Push these in. Uh, so we've got type, name, fitness. I've not changed this one yet. It was version and edition. Uh, I should have done that the other way because edition is an unwrap or unknown. And this one is the enum with a display, so we're just going to leave it like so. Oh, red squiggles. Okay, let's see. Uh, okay, so because it returns a... There's a nice thing for us to cover. Uh, let's talk about that in a second. <laughs> uh, and assuming this is the same. So there's multiple types of strings. And... Uh, 
and <laughs> sorry, I'm really bad at typing and talking at the same time. But, yeah, there we go. So, oh, sure, sure. What's your problem? Ah, same again. Okay. So yeah, there's three different types of string in Rust. Right, so let's cover all of them. There's ABC, which is a string which equals a string from blah blah. There is DEF, which is a string which equals a string. And then there's another one which we can't, I don't think I can just type it out, but there's like a OS string which equals an OS. Yeah, I could do it actually. OS stir. Is that OS stir from? Yeah, maybe I'll just do that. Okay, so. What's going on here? This first one is a compiler level string, which will be hard coded into the binary. If, if, I don't know if you've ever used the strings command on Unix, which can analyze a binary, pull out all the strings and tell you the things that are inside of it. They have a static lifetime, which means they live for the, they're in memory for the entire time the program is run. Um, these are great for things that never change and live inside of the code, much like that string right there. Like, you know, I. I'm not going to modify str. It just exists. It does mm -hmm. its thing. Then there's the second type of string, which is a kind of trait-based string like this, where we do modify it, and it can be changed, and it is mutable if we want it to be mutable. And we can actually convert these between each other relatively easily. In fact, I could do it into a string, or I could, no, yeah, and I can do... Uh, into string. So, so there's plenty of functions to help you jump between those two strings. And then because Rust runs on so many different platforms, there's a concept of an OS string, which is very specific to Unix or to Mac or to Windows, to, et cetera. This is when you have input from the CLI, the terminal, et cetera, where you actually have to convert it from an OS string into another different type of string. And the red squiggles that we got a minute ago were just me trying to pass in a uppercase string uh, from a static lifetime string. Now one could argue these never change and I probably shouldn't be using an uppercase string, but I'm not going to change the API on the stream. So we're going to leave it like this. We're going to jump over to our terminal and we're going to bask in the wonderfulness that is our new operating system context. Hopefully, there we go. Look at that, isn't that wonderful? Why did we get unknown on name? Should we have gotten a name there? Isn't that supposed to be? Uh, code code, oh, maybe yeah, there is no code, that's name. A code name. Yeah, maybe that should probably be the OS type is the name, so that's going to be Linux, Mac, etc. We'll just run that again. Shouldn't be too slow. And now we have our name, MacOS. There's no code name. We are a 64-bit system with a version and an unknown edition. Exactly what we were looking for. Nice. And just to show what we can now do with this, uh, we don't have the predicate syntax that we were talking about, mm -hmm. um, but we do have my dot .files. So let's pop them back open. Within the ginger templating? Uh, yep. And we're going to go args. So we'll change this to an echo, we'll do args, and we can do uh, user.username, in fact, let's just do name, and then let's use just one string, so os. <laughs> I forgot what we called it, name. Uh, we'll add the... Yeah, I think we have a name. Fitness. And we'll just keep this, does that keep it happy? Yeah, okay. Uh, we don't need our sudo here. Let's see if that works. I think it should. So cargo run dot fails font. Uh, oh yeah, uh, we need two yeah, v's it, to see command out. output. Did it? We we saw the command printed though. There we go. <laughs> it was interpolated in the command itself. Ah, there we go. So uh, yeah, up on line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Two lines up, though, it was, it was there. Oh, and I'm running it again like an idiot. Oh, yeah. Sorry, there we go. <laughs> okay, we can see it three different ways now. There we go. So 
uh, we now added a new context. We're pulling it, and this is great, right? This is a really practical thing for us to add because now these contexts are available um, within the Jinja template and syntax. And of course, when mm -hmm. we have the predicates, we can. That means that we'll have the ability to say only run this command on this system or this bitness, etc. Um, and yeah. that will be really useful for the GitHub releases, which I don't think we're going to have time to attempt now, but. You know, if we wanted to pull down a GitHub release, we need to know the system and the architecture to get the right binary. And now we sure. have an ability to do that. Yeah, cool. Relatively smooth. <laughs> yeah, I was expecting, I mean, obviously I haven't written tests. I'm sorry, I'll write tests, but uh, I, I think we should commit this together. Um, yeah, let's do it. So we'll do a git add. I'll do a commit. How do you add a co-author? Uh, yeah. Google is my pair programmer. <laughs> and uh, the fire flash was suggesting if you parse OS info into a string, it would put all that info into one big string, maybe? I don't know. Ah. Oh, uh yeah, so we can confirm that by taking a look at the OS info API. So if we take a look at uh, this info here, mm -hmm. we just want to know if it implements display. Yeah, and it does. So we, we could have that all in one available in the context as well for debuggy purposes of available. So yeah, good idea. Uh, I'm not getting much help here from GitHub. Can I just add co offered by to the commit? Yeah, okay. Let's do that. So get commit feature add OS context. And then get commit amend. I'm sure there's a nicer way to do this. <laughs> uh, what's your email address on GitHub? Uh, Sid.palace at gmail.com. I should switch it to my DevOps directive <laughs> one, but that, that works. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And hello to Francesco. Welcome. I will push this to audience. my fork. And open our pull request. And you now have your first contribution to come try. The first of many, I hope. Cool. Yeah, I can. Uh, what's the, the policy on reviews? Do I need to go review it since you committed it? Uh, we'll let the, I haven't added any tests. But I will go back and add them before I merge the, the pull request. Um, but once that's done, yep. we'll, we'll get it merged and you'll show up in the contributor list. And uh, that's a good day. I think I'm happy with that. Yeah. I mean, I, I've got more time if you want to work on tests now, otherwise we could, we could wrap up either way. Either way is fine with me. It's up to you. <laughs> I mean, I'd be interested to see sort of what, what testing in Rust looks like if it's not too too tricky to to add. Um, so adding the test won't be tricky. Um, the only thing that will be tricky is... No, it'll be fine. Uh, let's see. It's just because it's multi-OS, but we'll make it work. So let's make sure mm. that our test pass first. So we run cargo test. It's going to have to do a compilation with extra symbols and debuggy and stuff like that, but it won't take too long. And there's also, you know, dev dependencies that are only compiled in certain environments. And I think there's 30 tests or something. They should all be passing. We haven't touched anything there, so nothing should be broken, which is what I'm hoping for. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, 29 tests. So now we want to write a test. So tests and Rust are done as modules. Yeah, so and they just have... live alongside the code in the, the main Rust files. Yeah, so there are two different uh, ways of structuring this. this. This would be for unit tests, where we would create a mm -hmm. module within the file. Um, this config test means that we only compile it and run it in test mode. Okay. Uh, and it just means our, tests are, our unit tests are right next to the code that they're testing, which is great. Um, and then if we wanted more like acceptance test or end-to-end -end test, then we would have a test directory uh, out here, which would run against the binary and do some other stuff. But unit tests tend to live as a module next to the code that they are testing. 
We then used another macro called test or an annotation. I can't remember. Attribute, whatever Rust calls them. Yeah, attributes. Um, and then we can define a function. So it can. Uh, it can mac us. <laughs> Uh, and we are going to need to test this on each of our test targets that we run in CI. So we run it on Mac, we run it on Windows, and we run it on Unix. Fun thing here is I don't really know what the values are going to be on the other two. So I'm not going to know if they pass or fail until we push it to <laughs> CI. Or, I mean, I guess we can always check the code as well. So we can do that. But, uh, really, because this is just a simple we're just returning some data structure we just want to really make sure that we get the keys that we expect and that mm -hmm. on the operating system we get the right value there's no hard-coded things the tests aren't going to be great but they give us a little bit of confidence that we're doing the right thing and then we just want to consume our uh, api so uh, let with context equals our struct we then want to get our context, which will actually be our OS context dot, uh, what's the function called? <laughs> uh, we can do get prefix. Uh, why am I not getting autocomplete? Oh, because I have to pull in the module. All right. Uh, so that's actually the prefix. So we'll move this to its own test. Uh, test and super there's just giving me every module in the current file, or what is super giving me? Uh, so super is the module above this. So test, this is actually, like, if we were to imagine we were using this in another file, it would be creates context uh, OS test. Super mm -hmm. is going to be the OS context, which is the one above. Okay. So we're just pulling in all the definitions there. Yeah, which is, this is pretty idiomatic in Rustland. And the test just pull in everything from the, the actual pa uh, the module that we want to test. Uh, I want to test that we get the right prefix. So if anyone ever changed that, the test will fail. Nice and simple test. We're using the assert macro. And we're going to just say that we get a string of OS from our prefix. Uh, um, yeah, and we can run this. Oh yeah, I don't have a thing yet. <laughs> Copy the slide too. Okay, so we can run this one test. We make sure it passes. Underscore. Oh, because yeah, you're not you're using it. Exactly. And I always like to make sure that my tests fail too. So we we'll modify that again. Compilation times are fantastic. All right, cool. So that failed. So I'm happy with that one. So I'm going to save that. We'll move on. Uh, now, because I'm running on macOS, I think that's the first one we should obviously test. So we don't yep. need to pull the prefix again. Uh, what we will do is get the key value pairs. And we can get those from get context. And we've got a few assertions that we want to make here. So uh, the first one will be that we get I think the string was macOS. And this is key value pairs get uh, name. Yep. Let's see why it's complaining. I really wish VS Code would show you the error above all of the documentation. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this is just the option type. String to string. Uh, so we're going to do an unwrap or, and we'll do failed, which will fail. I don't want to do unknown because that could be actually returned at some point. Uh, and what is there? Well, it's a vector of context. Ah, okay. So we need to change that a little bit. So 
we don't return a vector with a string key and a string value. We have multiple different types of things that it could return. So really what we're actually checking here is that we get string uh, from name. And then on the right hand side, we get Oh, this is this is no trickier than I wanted it to be. Uh, let's build this assertion again. So if I do OS name equals key value pairs dot get and we want to get uh, it's not a name. Damn. So the what are we trying to get out there? Uh, so the problem, it's not a problem. The challenge is uh, we have a vector of key value content. Yep. And I guess I could always match against it, but we can't like pull an individual one out. Let's take a look at this. So this is something that I created. So it's an enum where you can either have key value or you can actually return a key that has a list of values. So the best way for me to test that I get the right thing here is actually going to be to enumerate all of the key value pairs. Uh, so we need to create an iterator and then we want to do a... Uh, So we can either filter to pull out the individual ones or we can just build the assertions into uh, a closure. So we could do a for each. And then this gives us our context here. Yep. And then we have a function where we've, we're have we going to have to match on the key and make sure we do the right assertion. So we can do a match on a context. Uh, I can't remember the structure now. Oh, it's a tuple. Okay, so zero. No. Context dot zero. Oh, I have to match on the type of context. I'll get there. There we go. So now we've got our two different types. So now we know what we're dealing with. Now we know that we're always going to be dealing with key value context here. We know that this is now the key value. Mm -hmm. Now we can build an assertion here. And um, if we did get a list context, we're going to consider that to be an error for the time being because we don't expect this context provider to return one. And the way that I do that is generally just by adding a assert, true, false, just force it to fail. Mm -hmm. So now we know that we have a key value context and we need to do the right assertion. So what I'm going to do here is do another match on the key and this is going to be our key. And I'm going to say that if I get a string from name, assert EQ. Um, That's where we want our Mac OS. I hope so. <laughs> um, and you, you, I think you may have touched on this earlier, but the it can Mac OS within CI, there's already some logic that will only test this one against uh, Mac OS and likewise for the Linux and likewise for Windows. Yes. So. Okay. Let me see if I can get this to stop yelling at me first. So I did a match key. Why are you complaining? Expected a tuple struct tuple variant found an association. Uh, what is key? String. All right, I'll do it a slightly less nicer way for the time being. So we'll say if k equals uh, name, then assert. I generally try and avoid if expressions, but uh, I'm not sure what I got wrong there. So we'll just do it this way for a moment and see if I can get it to pass. See if that's happy. All right, almost. And now it's just because it's a reference. Cool. I wonder if that's why the match was failing. 
actually. Uh, curiosity. I need to know. Uh, so, reference. Uh, close. Must be close. Ah. Okay, we'll just put it back. Oh, I've now lost my ev. I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> uh, okay, so if we get a name, I don't like this ev, but I'm not. I'll, I'll fix it later. Uh, I'd rather talk about the uh, macros to match the test on the right platform. So, if the value is a reference string. From uh, Mac. Mac OS. Okay. So we're doing a test. If we get a key values pair, this is one of the ones we expect. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's just do another one. Um, so we also have what was our context putting? Uh, fitness version edition. Uh, what was the edition? Do you remember? Uh, it was unknown. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it's safe, safe to assume the 64 bit is always going to be the bitness. I don't know if M1s are going to do something different. Uh, I mean, if Raspberry Pi, uh, you might have a 32 bit, right? Yeah, but or this, they is, all... this is all Mac right now. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, sorry. So hopefully we can get away with that. And in fact, we'll, we'll make this fail just for a minute, right? So I always like to see my test fail. But if I remember correctly, this is out of space. Yeah. So. We want. We only want this to run on a Mac. Uh, crap! Can I target Macs? We're gonna find out. Uh, so let's look at the. Let's run the test. Get ahead of myself. So let's compile that. Okay, testing failed, which is what we wanted to see. And uh, we can see here, left and right don't match because of yep. the space and. Where is our bitness? You're running 65 bit Mac OS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, because the assert fails it's, before it's, that. Does one. it exit before? As soon I, as you fail one, did it quit? Or? So, in a test framework, this assert macro will do a panic and it will stop that test case. So, the other ones won't be done. Uh, so, now we can run this again. We should see it fail for the 65 bit versus 64. I'm feeling confident, so I'm just going to change this already. I won't hit save yet. And there we go. Save and validate this. And then we'll run it one more time. We should see our test passing. And we have an unused variable here. So let's get that removed. Um, it's in my modules test. There we go. And test pass. So that's one. Now, we can copy this into Windows. What we want to say here is that we, I have no idea. I'm going to let CI tell me what that's supposed to be. <laughs> uh, and for Unix, we'll do this. Uh, our tests run on, let's check that, main.yaml. Pretty sure it is Ubuntu, Ubuntu 2004. Again, I don't know what these are going to be exactly, but I'll tweak as needed. We now need an additional test macro here, which just says only run this on Unix. We can do Windows. And I don't actually know. <laughs> If I can restrict that, I might have to like add a conditional in the test to actually query OS type and make sure. But we can check Rust test config macros and see if there's anything uh, target OS. Maybe that's exactly what we need. Whoa. <laughs> oh, right. I just need to type it. Uh, Config target OS Mac OS. I don't know. Uh, invalid predicate target OS. Did I get auto complete on this? No. All right. Uh, 
I'll look into that. I don't know. What we can do is a let OS equals OS info. Get and then say if OS and we want OS type dot equal. Oh, it's an enum. He's hacky. Don't do this at home. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I just need to. Yeah, this is this is horrible. But I, <laughs> right, I want to you, be we're system. using the the package in the test. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean we're not testing this one, so it's okay. But yeah, yeah. Know, I, I'm positive there will be uh, something from the Rust compilation config framework that I can target just Mac. But for now, we'll do this. In theory, I'm hoping I can run um, cargo test here. And then we'll push that. I'll let CI do its thing. It takes around 12 minutes. That'll get me my Windows values, my Linux values. And then we have some degree of confidence that our creators doing what we want. Um, now, the Unix one, uh, that's also going to need us to hack because Mac counts as Unix. So the targeting mm -hmm. here, uh, you can see from the language server protocol, my Windows test is grayed out. It's not going to run on this architecture. The Unix one does because Mac counts as that. So we will drop this in and just do another horrible, horrible piece of code where we say that OS dot OS type uh, equals, and we actually want Linux for this test. And hopefully all my tests pass on my Mac and then we'll let CI do the rest. Good. Great. And add OS context test. And we'll drop that co offer line back in. Uh, I wouldn't make you watch the, the 12 minutes, but you know, you can obviously subscribe to this PR. You can keep an eye on it. We can get it bears. And uh, we have some tests added to that. So, awesome. Tana, what's, your, what's your thoughts on Rust then now that you've, you've kind of walked through this with me? Yeah. I, I mean, I it it reminds me of moving from JavaScript to TypeScript where like there's a little bit of pain up front where you got to get all your types working properly and it'll it'll whine at you. But then once you have everything configured, the ability to then automatically tell you when there's something wrong and help you when there's something wrong uh, seems seems pretty powerful. Awesome. And any thoughts on Comtria? Do you think it's something that you will use? Or is, is there any features that you would like to see added to it? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I often, when I have little configuration snippets that I need to run, I just throw them in a make file and then run, I can run one-off uh, targets. And so I think, it's sort of a, a more holistic, mature uh, capability that will work cross-platform. I know a lot of my viewers get mad when they see a make file and they're like, <laughs> I'm on Windows, what do I do? Uh, and I say, go use WSL. Um, and so it, it could potentially be a, a solution there where uh, cross-platform allowing people to use it on, on whatever system they're on. So yeah, I think, I think it's definitely a cool project. Awesome, appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on. It was it was very informative for me. I think uh, we had some help from the the crowd as well. So thanks for people who are tuning in and helping us debug our typos. Uh, and everyone should definitely check out uh, David's channel, Raw Code, if you're into DevOps and Kubernetes, uh, and and go check out the Come Try a project on GitHub as well. Yeah. Any uh, final words? <laughs> uh, just you know, I, I hope that the goals of Come Try a align with you know, the people that are watching that are like, okay, that's, that's what I want from configuration management. And I hope that we can get more people contributing to it, adding more actions and, and atoms and just build out a really cool tool that will run anywhere and, and help people. I don't know, like 
I think formatting your operating system regularly is just a good habit to get in and trying to reduce the friction or the time to get in productive again is, is important to me and hopefully others. So come and help. Awesome. Yeah. Go get involved, people. Yep. All right. Take care. All right. Have a great day. Thank you, Seth.